My desk is a mess. You know what? You know what it is? Like you have to be cleanliness is next to godliness, they say. Um, and I am not a god. Yeah. Well, in, for people like me, it's also anxiety inducing when it's not. It's unbelievable. And I have all this stuff for the conference out all over the place. And I have part of my lunch out and I have notes and I have numbers and I have books and I have everything. And this weekend is bust a Windex and cleaning everything. <laughs> Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. Mine is editing stuff all weekend. I'm editing my desk. So we're kind of doing the same thing. There you go. Are you struggling with standardizing Microsoft 365 tenant configurations and keeping them the way you configured them? With Simeon Cloud, you can template your ideal tenant configurations and deploy them with just a click. Auto-deploy configurations for new clients, receive alerts on tenant drifts, and save your team endless hours of manual configurations. So why work for your tenant when it can work for you? Find out more at atmsp.link forward slash coreview. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the All Things MSP Podcast. I am your host, Justin Escar, with me always, and not from the podcasting attic. I lock him in normally, Mr. Eric Anthony. Eric, what's up, dude? No, I am on the road today. Uh, so, yes, I do not have the full studio. Uh, luckily, I, I did bring a light with me, but it's not working as well as uh, the podcast producer in me would like it to be working. Are we legally allowed to promote Ferris Bueller's Day Off, or has, have we hit the copyright time on that? And it's so, okay. That that's I don't, I don't know. I, I may end up cutting it out. You know, when we finally edit the podcast, we'll see. We'll see what. You happens. know what we should do, and if you stick around at the end, we'll see if Eric does this. At the end, we should do that clip from Ferris Bueller where he's like, "You're still here. Go home. It's over." That'd be good. That'd be good. I wish we talked about that off camera, so it made more sense. It's going to be more of a joke and surprise for everyone later. But oh well. Uh, what's up? Editing. Yeah, good editing. Yeah, uh, we have a guest. We have a guest today. Actually, we have multiple guests today. I love it when we have a guest. I always say that, Mr. Sean Walsh, and not the owner of Kava Restaurant, Mr. Dave Kava, authors of the Pumpkin Plan for Managed Service Providers. Hello, gentlemen. How are you? Excellent. How are you guys good. doing today? Awesome, awesome. Thank you for being here. Uh, love what you did with the background, Sean. It's perfect. Uh, for those who don't know you two. Uh, we'll do we'll do Dave first and Sean. Um, Sean, guys, give each other or give each other give everybody uh, one minute. Tell us who you are and uh, you know a little bit about yourself, and then we'll we'll jump right into what the book's about. Dave Kava, I ran Proactive Technologies along with a partner from 2007 to 2019. We were a financial services focused MSP in New York City. Built it up to a ten million dollar company it's, uh, before we sold it. I was the COO slash CFO, went through some crazy, wild, difficult, personal things uh, the following year or two, and then uh, this guy next to me rescued me off the scrap heap, and I joined Encore Strategic as a partner, and I run our recruiting division and do some um, facilitation of peer groups as well. That's awesome. Sean? And Sean Walsh, recovering MSP, uh, had an MSP that we grew uh, from the basement of our house to locations in four states, uh, sold it at the end of 2017, spent about three weeks on the couch uh, having panic attacks about what I was going to do next. I've always been involved in teaching. I've taught college. I've taught high school. I, I, I teach. I'm a scuba instructor uh, part of the year in Aruba. Um, so I said, you know, uh, Peer groups and consulting were a big part of what allowed our company to grow, and, and I felt that I could uh, jump into that. I had gotten my MBA uh, while I built my company and uh, put that to put that to use. I called up my lawyer. He told him to register an LLC. He laughed at me. He said, you couldn't even stay retired 30 days, could you? I said, nope, too many, too many ideas bouncing around in this head. So I started out with the peer groups. We added the direct consulting. And then when Dave sold his company, I, he told me about his idea on recruiting. And I said, hey, this fits together perfect. Why don't you come join me? So he did. And uh, that is uh, Encore as it is today. 
And uh, Eric, I have to say, I was surprised that wasn't your office because I, I, you know, a Ferris Bueller poster behind you just seemed completely appropriate. <laughs> it, it does, uh, and it is one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, but yeah, the you know, it, I don't know, the studio at home is just a little more uh, pimped out. I guess I'll just use, I'll use kid language. I was going to use colorful, but okay. You know, but the, the Ferris Bueller poster doesn't suck, so. No. I would like to say, Sean, as you're telling your story, like, I'm thinking about the fact that, like, how much you and I have in common, right? You mentioned you're an MSP. You were in, you were an MSP. You're in four states. I currently run an MSP. I'm in four states. You had panic, panic attacks on the couch after you sold. I have panic attacks on the couch every other day. Like, we're basically the same person at this point. Um, <laughs> Although you are in the minority, Justin, because you're, you know, we're, there's three recovering MSPs here, and then you, and then uh, me. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny, Justin. The panic attacks actually started in all seriousness about two weeks before we closed, because I really hadn't. We were so wrapped up in due diligence, I really hadn't thought about what am I going to do next. And all of a sudden, yeah. I, I started realizing it's going to be in two weeks. I'm going to have nothing to do here. And yeah. so I started saying, well, what do I want to do next? And I, and I signed up for some uh, from personality profiling certification tests. Uh, I signed up for my, my scuba instructor cert card. And then just to, be sh- just to be sure, I signed up to be an Uber driver. So I have, I have two rides to my name, both five stars. <laughs> You're a scuba, scuba, I was kind of trying to make this work, scuba, scuba, scuba like a scuba, scuba. Uber. Scuba. You Uber or scuba? <laughs> or scuba. Uber, scuba. Right. Let's, move on. Let's yeah. move on from this. Uh, well, thank you, gentlemen, both for being here. For those who don't know, uh, these two gentlemen wrote a very interesting book called The Pumpkin Plan for Managed Services Provider, uh, forward by Mike Michalowicz, which I think is an amazing pull. You know, I have my connection to Mike through ACES. He was uh, our keynote speaker in, in Arizona. But real quick, how did you guys, how did you guys get to Mike? So I was speaking on the ASCII uh, tour. So yeah. one of the ASCII road shows, I was asked to be one of the keynotes in that. And I had already started doing consulting. And when I first started looking around for materials to use for the consulting, I ran across Mike's uh, pumpkin plan consultant group. Now that's not run by Mike. He has somebody that runs that for him. Mike would occasionally come in on a on a Zoom call or something like that, but I, I really hadn't known him one-to-one yet. And uh, I hadn't been paying attention to the schedule for ASCII, and I got up on stage, and lo and behold, I found out just beforehand that Mike was going to be the main keynote. And as I'm starting my talk the first day I'm on stage, he comes in and decides to sit down right in front of me and take in my talk. I'm like... Ooh, no, no pressure here. So <laughs> afterwards, I went up, I introduced myself, explained to him that I was involved in his other group. And, you know, over the course of 10 shows, we, we got to be very friendly and got to know each other well. And at one point, Mike told us that he was uh, looking at opening up the pumpkin plan to do derivative books. He had already done that with Profit First. Mm-hmm. But they nobody had written a derivative yet of Pumpkin Plan, and Mike had come out of the IT services space, and so he approached Dave and I and said, "Would you guys be interested in in writing the first one?" So you know, we jumped on the chance, and we wound up doing a licensing agreement with him and his team, and they were very instrumental in helping us to understand the process. So, you know, Mike is very, very upfront that he works with a, a, a ghostwriter, um, AJ Harper, and, uh, and she, we met with her and she, she did a co-writer, co-writer. Co-writer. Yeah. ghostwriter, co-writer, but she, you know, she's the one kind of tapping the keys behind and putting the polish on it. And she did a great job of really sitting Dave and I down and giving us a, a realistic, a very realistic, um, education about what it takes to write a book. And I've read, I've read a lot of books about how to write a book. Um, and I will, I will give a plug for AJ here. And, and her book was by far the most practical and the most relevant. It was no sunshine BS. It was like, this is going to be hard work. It's going to take lots of passes. But if you do it right, you're going to come up with something that's, that's got some meat to it and some value and not just a vanity project. And I think, you know, so far, the, the, you know, the, the, the feedback we've gotten on the book has been very positive. So I, I think we, we 
hopefully got some value out there for some folks. And that's the feedback we've been getting so far. But, you know, that's how we came to work with Mike and his team. That's awesome. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I worked with a business coach for a while who was part of the Profit First training group. So I didn't work with Mike directly. It was actually because of her, this really awesome woman named Jennifer Dawn, who I got to meet Mike and I actually went to his offices in Jersey yep. um, and then eventually got him to speak at the conference. And at the time he was talking about, oh, he was talking about Pumpkin Plan at the time, right? And so he had come to ACES, which is a group of you know Apple-based MSPs. And basically it laid out. So so um, I'm going to throw this one at Dave. Dave, for those who don't know what Pumpkin Plan is, especially Pumpkin Plan for managed services, you want to maybe give everybody like a like an overview on what that's all about? Yeah, I want to take a half step back and deconstruct the line where Sean said, we jumped at it. You know, there, eh, we, there was a lot behind we jumped at it. Sean came to me and said, you know, we've got this opportunity. It might be kind of cool. We've been talking about writing a book. And I said, gee, Sean, that's a lot of money. If we spend it, it'll force us to actually write it. You know, so that was, that was like, you know, we swung up, I swung a foot over my ass and kicked myself in the ass because I, I knew if we spent the money, we're actually going to write the book. So there was, there was a lot of knowing what it would take to get things done. So we didn't just sit around for 10 years thinking about writing a book and, and, and never did. Yeah, absolutely. But, and, and we had some deadlines because ASCII said, okay, you're writing this book with Mike. We want to have you in there. And so we had the deadline of the show starting. So there was some, some good motivators there that we wouldn't have had otherwise. It's, it's good to, put yourself in a situation where you're forced to perform when you know that's what is needed for you to perform. Yeah. Failure was not an option. <laughs> and I have another funny connection to, to Mike because Mike, Mike's first company was a tech support company and he talks about it in the pumpkin plan. And it was, it was um, called uh, Olmec. Oh yeah. And I knew Olmec. I started, I started reading the pumpkin plan. I was like, wait a second. I know this company. And I knew it after Mike had exited. I got to be friends friends with the owner, who was Mike's original partner, who Mike sold out to. And they were like best friends in high school. And I never knew like that was Mike's MSP until I read the book. And I was like, I know this company. I know this guy. I know what they're up to. And, you know, it, it was really so there was a personal connection there that was kind of interesting. But the reason the pumpkin plan is such a good fit for MSP is because MSP is an entrepreneurial business that's that's usually bootstrapped. It's services based. And the whole idea behind the pumpkin plan is that in order to really succeed as an entrepreneur, you need to you need to focus and figure out what you're best at, figure out who your best clients are and how you do what you're best at for your best clients. We call that the seed, right? Second step is to weed. That means you get rid of the clients that are not a good fit, uh, the ones that are just, you know, we call them cheap, cheap pain in the ass clients, but once you get to a certain level of maturity, it goes beyond the ones that are cheap and a pain in the ass and the ones that really just don't fit your sweet spot. They really uh, aren't the right clients for you. Second half of weeding is just avoiding shiny objects. You know, a lot of MSP owners will jump at any opportunity that comes at them because it's revenue, right? Any re All revenue is good revenue, and that's that's a big lie. Stop nodding your head. <laughs> for those, who are, for those uh, who are listening and not watching on youtube.com slash all things MSP, as Dave is saying this, I'm turning bright red and waving my hands up in the air because I am, I am 100% guilty of all of this. Well, I mean, Sean, everything Sean and I wrote from, from experience, right? You see, three quarters of the things that we're, we're telling people to do are things we got wrong before we got them right. Exactly. You know, like, I mean... I could I could tell you horror stories all day long about things we took on that we shouldn't have taken on, and you know the 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 chaos that ensued, and and how it slowed our company down and kept us from really meeting our full potential uh, faster. So anyway, seed right. Figure out what you're best at, who you, who you're best at doing it for. Weed, get rid of bad clients, avoid shiny objects, and feed. And that involves creating processes for your MSP and marketing around your strengths. So in a nutshell, that's the pumpkin plan for MSPs. And we go into a ton of more detail on those things and just condense seven steps down to three right there. Uh, and then we talk about a lot of the things that go into the day-to-day -day of running a really successful MSP. So it's about 15% 
content that's derived from the original pumpkin plan by Mike and about 85%, you know, things we learned in the business over the years. And some of it is, you know, the correct fundamentals of the MSP business. And some of it is how to really run one with excellence. That's awesome. And for those who have never read the original pumpkin plan, the, the reason it's, it's called the pumpkin plan is the story that Mike tells in it is about pumpkin farmers trying to grow award-winning blue ribbon pumpkins. And the idea is that you start with this slew of pumpkins in your pumpkin field. Uh, you let Charlie Brown do his thing. And then you get rid of all the ones that aren't growing and you seed and water and feed the big one until it becomes the massive award-winning pumpkin, which, you know, th- there's your, there's your like baseline for this. So I do want to jump in because, um, there's, I- I'm going to, I'm going to jump right to chapter six because anyone, if you're listening to this, go buy this book, Amazon, I'm assuming. Yes. Amazon, uh, go buy this book on Amazon, buy it right now and pause and, and read it and then pick it up right from here. Ready? One, two, three, go. Cool. So we're at chapter six because I'm going to jump right ahead for a second. Um, a ruthless inventory. Now, this is what this is why I want to talk about chapter six for a second. Um, I was talking to a consultant friend yesterday, and um, they were telling me that they were hurting a little bit. Right? They they weren't making their numbers. There weren't people. There were clients that weren't paying, and like all these things, and there was rules and whatever. And I said, and I I, I said to him, I said, listen, I'm going to be nice. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to be a New Yorker to you. You're too nice. And he's like, that's the meanest thing anyone has ever told me. And I was like, you need to be more ruthless. And I mean that from two perspectives. One, from looking at your clients and getting rid of the ones who are not paying you on time or figuring out what that problem is and cutting off all the the the, the bullshit clients. And also internally, which you guys talk about in the book as well, which is like, stop doubling up on and tripling up on tools and like call every vendor you have and ask for a discount and like do all these things. Like I was like, cause what caught me was the ruthless part. Cause I was like, you have to be ruthless as an entrepreneur, which is I think really hard for a lot of MSP owners, right? Because not to generalize a lot of MSP owners are introvert. They're a little bit more quiet. They want to be a little bit nicer. Not everyone has that brash New York attitude that I'm so well known for. Um, But like you have to be ruthless. Can you get in? I want you to get in a little on this one here. Uh, You know, an example of exactly what you're talking about is the other day I'm combing through the, uh, I'm combing through Reddit and I come across a post in the MSP forum and this person is saying, Hey, does anybody have any recommendations for this tool that does this? Because I just went and talked to this prospect and they'll sign up with us, but only if we change our tools and we do this and we bring in this other tool that they like, that'll bring this in. And I just want to scream at them. Stop. You sell to the people who will do business your way. You can't customize your entire business model for every client that says, I want something different. It's not scalable. And you have to be selling to the people who want to buy what you have. And if and if they don't want to buy what you have, then they're not a fit for you. And, and that's an, just an example of one of the clients that you have to be willing to say no to. You know, one of the people that I quote in the book a lot is Michael Porter who, from Harvard Business School, who's considered kind of the modern father of, of business strategy. And, you know, Porter's one of Porter's quotes is that in, you don't have a strategy until you can tell somebody no. So you can't please everybody, you know, and that's a big problem that we see with the people we work with. But there's a couple of, you know, very common issues with MSPs and MSP owners. Um, and, it, you know, again, Sean and I example one and one A, the, you know, we came from the engineering side. We didn't go into the business as business people, right? So if you're graduating from Harvard or, you know, business school or Wharton and, you know, you're used to looking at spreadsheets and planning out your profit, know ex- exactly how you make money. You have a plan, you go execute it and we just fix it. You know, like that, the, the down the road, we figure out, Hey, I guess I should be running this like a business. Cause I have all these problems that derive from bad decisions I've made or the fact that I'm not making enough money or, or whatever, I, I think I need to figure out the business side of this. And it, it's the tail wagging the dog. So most of us look at our business and we're not, we're not data driven. 
and we're not even analyzing what's working well and what isn't. So if you have two thirds of your clients that are pushing your business forward and one third that's pulling it backwards, can you imagine how it's going to take off if you lop off that third that's that you're the clients you're losing money on that are taking a disproportionate amount of everybody's time that aren't paying their bills? They're, they're not, it's not like those clients are helping the business a little. They're actually taking it backwards. And, and in order to you know, get that jet fuel going forward, you just got to lose them. And the data will tell the story. Yeah. You got you to gotta, you gotta extract the numbers. And, and not only that, but you got to extract the right numbers. And one of the things that, that we typically do when we go into a client for the first time is we want to start going through the agreements. We don't want to just see profitability for the, for the company. We want to see profitability client by client. And you need to know that. You need to know it down to the to a, a decimal point or two. You know, we go into we go into these businesses and we say, "What's your profitability?" And they go, "Well, I think it's somewhere around maybe." And I go, "Stop!" So you don't know what it is. We had one place we went through the client list, client by client, and determined the agreement gross profitability of each client. And almost fifty percent of the clients. We're, we're losing, they were losing money on almost 50%, some right. to the tune of thousands of dollars a month. I said, by God, you can hire, you can fire half your client base and be more profitable tomorrow and do half the work. <laughs> can I, can I, wait, can I jump in? Was that just because of the number of tickets the client was submitting or was it some of the like, yeah, the cost? They were putting way too many hours in. They had just pulled a number out of the sky and said, here's your monthly fee. It wasn't based on anything other than them just sticking their finger in the air and, and taking right. the cost. And it made, the pricing made no sense. It wasn't based on anything logically. And then, like I said, we started doing the math and, and it was just, it was insane. I mean, and, and, and that's not, I mean, that's kind of a drastic example, but the other ones aren't that far off. <laughs> so, I'm a, no, see, you know what, Eric? This is why I hate when we have guests because we have guests yeah. on the we have guests on this podcast, and like I sit here and I'm like, uh, I have such a yeah. headache from listening to this because like I'm like, I need to hire these guys. Like this is just, it hurts so bad. And as the only MSP still on this call, uh, I need to get out of this business. Really- so, because, well, it's because- we can just turn this into a sales call if you want. I mean. The, the- we're, you know, as MSPs, so many are focused on the day to day because traditionally it's such a firefighting job, right? Absolutely. And that's how we start out. So that's how we continue to run until somebody shows us the light, right? And, and, and my light was, again, a number. And, and that number was my MRR. You know, back in the days, you know, I had auto tasks sitting on a screen 24 7 in the office. That would show me what my MRR was. And if it was not going up consistently, I knew I had a problem. And that was what clued me into numbers matter and tracking things matter. And I completely agree, by the way, with the tracking every contract's profitability. Because I know, because I did this, like I went through and I did a weeding, even this was before the pumpkin plan, because I've been out for a while. But I had what I think it was four customers out of 30 that I was again, legit losing money on and probably another uh, five or six that were so close to zero that it didn't matter if they were there or not. MoveBot is the simplest, fastest data migration and moving tool there is supporting over 30 storage and email platforms today. Move data like a pro at atmsp.link forward slash MoveBot. Today's podcast sponsor is SuperOps. Elevate your IT managed service provider business with SuperOps, the all-in-one platform that integrates RMM and PSA. Powered by AI-driven insights and automation, SuperOps helps you stay ahead, streamline operations, and boost efficiency. Are you ready for operational excellence? Find out more at atmsp.link forward slash SuperOps. Yeah. Let me tell you that, it's a very common thing for MSPs to chase the whale account and then they discount things to try and get the whale account and the whale account wants them to discount things because they think the big company can can work over the small company and it turns out that they're spending a third, half of their man hours 
on an account that they're actually losing money or barely making money on. I saw this just the other day. You know, I'm in the same uh, social media groups as everyone else with all the MSP owners, and somebody posted and said, I've got a chance to get a really big account. You know, it's 120 users. You know, my normal my normal user rate is 125. I'm thinking discount at 30%, blah, blah, blah. And I said, you know, and I know this from experience, not just from reading, like bigger accounts tend to take more time per user, mm-hmm. not less. Yeah. And you're gonna what you're going to do is take all the time and energy of your business and put it into something that's, you know, are you telling me your margins are 50% so you can afford to give away 30 like the, if your margins are fifteen percent, it means that once you give away thirty percent of it, they're negative fifteen yeah. percent. Like the math does not does not yeah. work, you know. Like, but we're not wired to to think I, in that I way. Find that someone funny. comes along and well, says, well, "Look," because I've seen that before. Also, where like someone has that, it's like, "I want to get this account. I want to give them a discount," and I'm always like, "Don't like." If they if they want to work with you, they'll pay your price. Absolutely. Like that really is what it comes down to. You should not be offering a discount. The only time I ever offer a discount is if it's a nonprofit, and at which point, like, it's rare. It's a rare occasion that I'll do it because I, maybe I want to support the nonprofit and I, on the other side or whatever it is. But like, I will never offer a discount out of the gate. I will just take items off the list. This way, the profit margin kind of stays, or like the hourly kind of stays the same, um, you know. And say, okay, fine. If you don't want to pay our price, you're not going to get backup or DNS filter or whatever. Take my cog out of it, and I could adjust accordingly and remove the few pennies off the you know the total or whatever it is. But to give, oh, you do need to hire us. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know, you I know. know. Our <laughs> Uh, One of the big problems that we see with MSPs is they they really don't think about the difference between cash flow and profit because they obviously are not the same thing. And they see a big account and they see all that cash, but they don't calculate how much do I get to keep at the end. So so that's one of the things that we have to look at. I mean, Dave had a company that he was working with that that went through and they they had a – Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they were around $3 million in revenue and one client was worth a million dollars a year. They finally realized they were losing money on it. They, and they, they did what most of us shudder to do. and They fired a million-dollar client. And they yeah, had they were the most profitable year the next year. They had a three, their $3.2 million company in Texas <laughs> that had one big co-managed IT account that was just tremendously noisy and difficult, you know, consuming the owner's time. So it was over a third of their revenue. It was like forty percent of their revenue, and they, and they and they fired the account that was forty percent of their revenue. Wow. And their revenue the next so their revenue went from three point two to a run rate of one point nine. By the end of the following year, it was back up to two point three, but their but their bottom line had doubled. Yeah, you know, with less revenue. Uh, just and, and, it's, you know, it's, people need to realize that it's top line for vanity, bottom line for sanity. I mean, the, the top line number doesn't mean crap. It doesn't yeah. matter how much you bring in. It only matters how much you get to keep. Okay, so two <laughs> parts of this is that one hilarious. You know, it's hilarious that you say this because years ago uh, I was talking to a consultant and and I was kind of new in the game and I was like, you know, hey, how much how much do you make? And they were like, I make 1.2 million top line. I was like, how much of that is profit? He's like, profit doesn't matter. And I and I am not a technologist, right? I'm a business student, not a warden. I went to the University of Rhode Island. Thank you. And uh, and I was like, I, I don't think that's the right answer, man. I, I don't, I don't. <laughs> like, I think profit matters. So like, you, that, you, that you, hit me you, are, you are a student of the obvious. Yeah. So that hit me. <laughs> but, then, but then you guys have been talking and what, of course, we're having this phone call today. Uh, a couple of weeks ago on the podcast, you guys may have heard uh, Adam Boris from uh, Vista Business Group, and he offered a free valuation for everyone. And so they did a, a valuation of my company. And I got to say, like, I thought I was doing really well. And looking at the valuation, I'm like, uh, what? Because after they did all the math and the EBITDA, and they didn't even take in consideration the clients, they just looked at the contracts and my EBITDA, just my valuation was way lower than I thought it was, which means my profitability is way lower than I thought it was. And it got me thinking and I'm like I'm like I call up my president. This is I'm this is a true story guys. I'm like an hour ago I'll show you the slack. I call my president. I was like, "Hey, I don't know why, but our Pax 8 bill for this year is like this much and our Pax 8 income 
according to our billing software, is about $100 more than what it cost us. I was like, something's wrong. And like, all of this has been sitting on me. And now we're having a call with you. And now I really want to have a panic attack. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. What you're describing there is one of the key reasons why we are so adamant that you have to have a budget. Because if you have a budget and you predict exactly what your revenue should be each month and exactly what your what your expenses should be and that you should have exactly this much profit if you hit the numbers every month you can go down that list and you go whoa that number's off what happened i mean we found a company that was paying a vendor um a couple of thousand dollars a month for for two years that they had no idea that they were paying I mean, the, and, and when you go through and you do what we call a zero-based budget, where you start with zero at every category on your P&L, and you go, okay, do I need this? If I need it, is there some way to get it for free? If I can't get it for free, can I get it for less? When, when you go through and you do that, every dollar you discover goes right to the bottom line. Yeah. It's not a percentage. The whole dollar goes right there in your pocket. and. I have, in, in doing a zero-based budget with companies that have never done it and never analyzed their expenses, we have found as much as, as 10, 12%, which for some companies is their entire profit. Yeah. And it's scary how much money we find doing zero-based budgets. And once and again, we get somebody to do it, they do it. This is that ruthlessness. Like one of the things that I've been pushing on my team, as everyone who's listening knows, we moved to Halo. And like Halo has a bunch of other features of things that we're still paying for. So like, we're finally getting the billing module working. Cool. We're getting FreshBooks out. We're not paying for that anymore because we're already paying Halo for it. So right now we're paying double. Same with Typeform. And we actually, this week, and I'm really happy that my team did this, a repair shop uses a different product than the rest of the consultative team. They're in a different ticketing system. And so it took us six weeks and I was like, I was like I'd rather spend time than money and say, okay, I'm already paying my team. How can we take the repair tickets and move it into Halo? And they did it. They turned it on yesterday with like a whopping success. And guess what? There's another $150 a month, $180 a month. I'm not paying for this other ticketing service. And this is what Especially I was when that time is a one time investment. You yeah. Know? And that's what I was talking also yeah. going back to the ruthless system. What I was talking to my friend about earlier yesterday is that like, you need to go through and look at everything. Like I need to call our file share in the cloud company and say, get me a better deal because we're paying them a lot of money and I need better profit. Like those kinds of things are the things that the owners of MSPs should be doing. But as we kind of all discussed and we all know this, too much, too many of us are in the day to day. Too many of us are putting out fires. Too many of us are technical. We don't think about this kind of stuff. And that's really why everybody who's listening should pick up this book right now on Amazon and read it cover to cover. Don't just skip to chapter six like some people I know. <laughs> let, me, let me go back to your Pax 8 story for a minute. Um, you know, I tell people until you get to the point where your company has a, a real CFO, which is probably around $10 million. You know, most MSPs don't have a CFO. Uh, the owner is the CFO. And, and it really is one of the most important jobs, if not the most important job in the, in the, uh, in the company. You know, it's the, how do we make money? How, do the, how does every decision we make affect the bottom line? You know, oh, why don't these, why don't these uh, lines line up on the P&L? Why, why are we only billing $100 more than our expense when we should be making whatever percentage? You know, somebody's got to watch. Yeah the ship, right? And so I tell the story in the book of one MSP I work with that went from in business for 20 years and he went from $4,800 a month in MRR to over 18,000 in a year. Never thought he could do it, went 20 years without changing. And you know, $18,000 a month in MRR doesn't sound uh, like a lot, but for a guy that's never had any MRR, it's life changing. He has stability in his business now and something to add on and he's, he's uh, kept it going from there. But there was another guy in that group who had about $18,000 a year in recurring revenue and in one year got it to 36. And I said, I said, you doubled your MRR in a year, you know, and for a small company that, that, you know, that's no small feat. How did you do it? And he told me that about half of it was just going through his contracts and his billing and figuring out the things that he wasn't billing for that he should have been all along. 
you know, which is insane to me. Like the, 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 that that could go on for year upon year upon year upon year. And like, he's leaving, he was leaving like 50% of, of uh, or whatever it came out to at the end, 25% of his company's revenue on the table. You know, it's a difference between making money or losing money or, you know, or going from a, a $50,000 a year salary to a $100,000 a year salary. I mean, it's, it's crazy, but it's like you said, we're so focused on um, got to, got to attend to this emergency. Got to keep the team happy. Got to keep the clients happy. You know what, what's going on with the business? Uh, well, I'll, maybe I'll worry about that at the end of the month, you know, uh, oh, yeah. somebody's service. Yeah. And if he wasn't you know. going into debt, then all of that is profit. Well, we, yeah. we just did this with an MSP that we're working with and they went around to their, they, they went through the list of clients, figured out who wasn't profitable, figured out where they needed to get to, to be at the right amount of profit. And he, and he went around to each client and met with them. And out of 10 clients, and I would say more than half of them, their bill doubled. He went around and they were, and, and, and other, all out of the 10, only two said no. And those were two that really fit the pain in the ass category. And we had told them, you shouldn't even, you should just fire those ones. So they self-selected out. And all the other eight were like, yeah, we were kind of wondering when you were going to raise your prices. Your way, your way. We knew you were way too cheap, but we weren't going to tell them to tell you to raise them. So, exactly. I mean, and, and, you know, so, uh, you know, 100% increase on several contracts. And now they're headed to have their most profitable year ever. That's awesome. Well, Dave, you brought something up about empowering your team and talking to your staff, but we don't actually have time to talk about this. I love, I love where we went with this. And I'm sorry we didn't get to talk a little bit more. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dave Kava, Sean Walsh, get the book. The Pumpkin Plan for Managed Service Providers, A Roadmap to MSP Prosperity. I can't say that word. Um, it's available on Amazon. We'll have a link in the show notes. It's it's $16 for paperback on Amazon, at least according to my Amazon. Invest the $16 so you can make more profit on the bottom line. Increase your rates. Be ruthless. Uh, Dave, Sean, thank you so much for being here. Uh, it was a pleasure. And I think that's everything. Eric, any final words? Yes, I do, actually, because I can do this as the podcast producer. We are going to give away five copies of this book to the first five people who comment to the YouTube video, at, you know, after we post this podcast. So comment on the YouTube video and we will select the first five and we will get you the pumpkin plan for MSPs. That's awesome. And if you need that address, I really appreciate that. And if you need that address, it's youtube.com slash at all things MSP. Follow us at facebook.com slash group slash all things MSP. Like and subscribe on all of your favorite uh, platforms. I mean, you're already listening to us. Just leave a review. Tell us you love us. Tell us you love Dave and Sean. I don't care. Just give us something. Uh, engage with the group. Talk to everybody there. There's so much happening there. And from uh, Eric and I, thank you so much for listening. Bye. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow us on Facebook, but better yet, go ahead and join the Facebook group. You can also follow us on Instagram, if that's your thing. And make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, at All Things MSP, to catch us in all of our video glory. And last, but certainly not least, if LinkedIn is your thing, you can follow us there as well. And a special thank you to our premier sponsors, SuperOps, MoveBot, Gozinta, EasyDMark, and Comtech. And we also want to thank our vendor sponsors. The All Things MSP Podcast is a BizPow LLC production.